back we go. So is your dog afraid of going for walks? Uh, we're talking about getting out the front door and hopefully a little bit farther <laughs> out the front, down the street, perhaps on a nice walk. Um, what I was trying to say earlier when I was um, apparently muted or not on the right microphone is that, um, you know, in previous weeks, we have talked about conditioning or teaching your dog to have a leash put on, harness put on. If you have one of these dogs where you adopted them um, and found that they have no apparent history with being on leash or going for walks. So obviously you will have to train your dog to be comfortable having a leash put on and having the feeling of the leash on their collar or harness, having a little tension on the leash because that will happen even if you try not to let it happen before you try much in the way of going for walks. So those are in previous weeks. You can find them on the blog, dogkindtraining.com slash blog, um, if you're not there yet. So to start with this training, your dog at least has to be comfortable having a leash put on. Okay, so today, who is this for? If you have a dog who won't go out the front door at all, um, or maybe you can get them to go out, but they freeze up, um, don't want to move far from home, or they try to run back home after you get, you know, down the walk or a little bit away from the house. Uh, these are the dogs that would benefit from this kind of training. So just a, a few key sort of concepts to keep in mind, and I'll, I'll bring this slide back again later in the presentation. Um, this first point should start to sound like a broken record by now, if you've been following the last several weeks, uh, don't force it. So that means phys don't physically force it. Don't pull on the leash. If your dog is scared to go outside, um, sometimes the temptation is to say, well, if I just need to get them outside, they'll see there's nothing to be afraid of. So I just need to pull them. Um, if you've tried this, you may have realized that it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so don't force it. This is more likely to set you back than to gain you any ground in your training. Now, I'll, I'll touch on this also in a minute, but when I say don't force it, I do mean don't pull on the leash. But the other thing you um, people sometimes do that maybe isn't physical force, but is, a, is kind of putting pressure on your dog is um, trying to lure them farther than they're willing to go with high value treats or farther than they really want to go. So we'll talk about that more in a minute. So we're letting the dog dictate the pace in this training. Second point is, you know, every dog is an individual. Find out what makes it easier for your dog to leave the house and go for a walk. Um, for some dogs, this might mean having other dogs, dog friends nearby if they're dog friendly, um, having certain people involved or more people with them. Uh, some locations may be easier than others for your dog to walk in. And it might take a little bit of experimentation, but if you can identify any of these sort of helping hands you can have for this training, it can speed things along uh, quite a bit. But speaking of speeding things along, the last piece is let go of timelines. Um, I know that when we adopt dogs, we, you know, we think dogs go for walks. That's what we're supposed to walk dogs. Um, that's what you do with a dog, right? You go for walks. And if you have a dog who didn't want to go for a walk when you adopted them, um, that might seem kind of unusual or abnormal and you feel that you need to hurry up and get them out on walks so they can, um, you know, experience the world, enjoy the joys of sniffing and um, it's sort of a normal dog thing we expect all dogs to do. And I see frustration, especially, um, you know, in our Facebook support group, I've seen several people say, well, my gosh, my dog, you know, I've had my dog for weeks, still hasn't gone for a walk, won't, months, my dog won't go out the door. Um, the process I'm going to show you today did take months for us. And um, the dog tells you it takes as long as it takes. So it will be less frustrating if you sort of let go of the idea that there's a certain amount of time this should take because it varies. It varies from dog to dog.
Okay, so leaving home. Remember, we've got, at this point, I'm assuming you have your dog trained to accept, you know, having a leash put on, maybe a harness. Um, so how are we going to get out on our first outing? So quiet, pick a quiet time. Um, this might seem like common sense, but I just wanted to point it out. You know, if you live in a neighbor, say a residential neighborhood that has typical activity times of like, you know, early morning when people are going to work, uh, mid-afternoon kids coming home from school, and then later in the evening people coming home from work, um, those aren't the times to do this training. You're going to want to pick a, a quieter time. And here I say location as well. Um, if you live in a pretty busy neighborhood and there isn't a very quiet time for you to work at your front door, you might consider, if your dog is comfortable in the car, um, trying to get them to the car and then driving them to a quiet location to work on, um, on walking. Um, one common misconception is that when you start this training, you have to start by leaving the house. <laughs> And you don't. Um, many dogs are likely not going to go out the front door willingly during your first session, maybe not your second, third, fourth, or fifth session, and that's okay. Um, you'll see what I mean in a second. Pancake did not willingly go out the door in the first at least two or three training sessions we had. If your dog already knows some skills or training games, like find it, hand touch, um, whatever tricks, you can use those to make their experience a little more fun. And I'll show you how I sometimes would use hand touch um, and also find it or treat scatters with pancake. All right, so as I show you the, the example videos here, I'd like you to pay attention to this and I'll, I'll come back to this again. These are This is really important. The dog chooses how far you're going to go. So, when you start a session, try to avoid having a, a preconception about how far you're going to get. Say, oh, today we're going to work on getting from the front door to the sidewalk. Um, just go into it without expectations and see where, where your dog can tells you they can get to. So dog chooses how far to go. You'll also notice I'm using a long leash in a lot of these, actually in all of these videos, and that is helpful for giving the dog more freedom and preventing the leash from getting tight without me meaning it to. Always allow a return to the home base or a safe space, especially in early training. So that might mean having easy access to get back into the house or if you're working from a car, back into the car. And then this idea of ping-ponging, um, if you, some of you have been in the reactive dog course or in our training membership, this might sound familiar, but um, there's a, a tendency and an urge to kind of, if your dog starts to go out the door, you want to continue encouraging them to go farther and farther. And I'm going to show you how it can actually be, um, can help you make faster progress and also be more fun for the dog and have less pressure on the dog if you are doing some advancing and some retreating, sort of ping-ponging back and forth from easy to difficult tasks or easy to difficult locations. It shouldn't always just be getting harder. Okay, so here's our little man, Pancake, during one of his early training sessions. So what we have here is the front door. It is open. Um, he has a long leash on, which I have a hold of just for safety. But he um, has settled down on this mat, and that's fine. He's looking outside, and a lot of your dogs, this might even be too much, being right at the threshold. You may need to start farther back. So I'm just giving him treats, trying to reinforce even, you know, looking out. Not He's not retreating from the front door. He's seeing whatever activity. That was a little accidental, but he was willing to... Stick his nose out and his little tail wag there onto the threshold. So that was also accidental bounce, but he came out and got the treat and doesn't immediately draw back. So I gave him, I rewarded him again. Because remember, we do the behavior we want is going through the door and walking down the street. Um, so if he offers behaviors like that, that are in that direction, moving out the door, I definitely want to try to reinforce those but I don't want to push only for those. Um, I don't want to have the bar too high. So here he had come out 
and he'd been out for a little bit. And this was, you know, an early training session. So I tossed a treat behind him to encourage him to go back in the house and try again. So that's a little bit of that ping ponging, which I'll show you more of in a minute. So does that make sense to everyone so far? You could see that Pancake was choosing where he was going to go. He, we, I always kept that front door open in early training, so he always had the option of going back inside. And we were ping-ponging between, you know, farther out the door and back into the house. <clears throat> All right, here's a later session. Um, you can see from his body language, um, he's feeling a little better here. We've got some tail wags. Um, he's looking out the door. I tossed a treat into him where he was, so it didn't require him to go farther. I think it's under my running shoe, a little bit messy by the front door. And here I think he chooses to take a step toward me, so I definitely want to reinforce that. And I think I'll probably toss this next treat back into the house. So it's not, I want to limit um, in the beginning when he can, I know he's still kind of nervous about the or outdoors. I want to limit uh, how long he's out in sort of a more difficult location for him. So there's treat back inside. And then he can make the decision, am I comfortable to come back out again? Um, so that's just something to think about when you're working with these sensitive pups that the location, like how far from the house, matters in terms of difficulty, as does how busy is the neighborhood at this time. But duration outside can also matter a lot. So um, doing that ping ponging in and out with treats can um, can help you help prevent you from like accidentally pushing duration too long, like they were out and they seemed okay. But you know, after a while, it starts to get too much, maybe. So going in and out helps um, prevent that. Okay, I wanted to touch on using treats in this scenario. Um, because a lot of people are a little too pushy with treats, but there are also quite a wide variety of opinions out there from, um, <laughs> from trainers about whether or not it is appropriate to use food, um, as in food lures in this situation with fearful dogs. Um, so a food lure or a, a pr food prompt could be, um, anytime where you're using visible food to try to to before the dog does a behavior to try to get them to do a behavior. So the way I've seen food lures used badly for um, dogs like this who don't want to go out the front door is someone holds a treat out and the dog, you know, stretches. They want the treat, but they don't really want to go forward. Or maybe they do come just a little bit forward, but they look anxious. And then the person, instead of giving them the treat for, you know, bravely forging ahead, moves the treat back farther to try to get them to go farther. Um, and often the dog will say, well, forget you, you know, you're obviously, <laughs> I did that thing. You didn't pay me. I wasn't reinforced. I'm not going to try again. And I'm scared. And then people say, well, I tried treats, but it didn't work. Um, so don't use food lures that way. That would be my preference is that you don't use food in your hand to try to lure, you know, pull your dog out using a high value treat. Um, now some people will say don't use food lures at all. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. My personal opinion, though, is that it has helped me and many of my clients to use them um, carefully in particular situations. So I really like, and you'll, I'll show you a bunch of examples of this, using treat tosses or scatters on the ground um, that gets the dog's head down. They might encounter other reinforcers while they're down there, like things to sniff. And also, if you've tossed the food on the ground, it makes it impossible for you to then change the deal after the dog sees the food and decides if they're willing to go forward to get it or not. So it, it prevents that that sort of us getting greedy, saying, oh, you take the step forward, maybe just a little farther before I give you the treat. Um, I'd recommend only very tiny distances forward if you say, okay, my dog's you know, at point X and I want them to come forward. If you're going to put treats on the ground, I'd recommend doing no more than one step forward from where they are now. Uh, don't do it if the dog is scared, which is kind of a subjective statement. But if your dog is already, you know, shaking or tail tucked, lip licking, ears back or stretching to get the treat, um, the whole setup is too hard for them. And, um, 
trying to make them go even farther out of their comfort zone is unlikely to get the results you want. And it's also not very nice to them. So if the dog is scared, um, scrap the training session or reset the training session at a much um, easier sort of context or setup where your dog isn't showing you that they're so frightened. And finally, use that ping ponging. So maybe I'll, you know, put a treat or two down and say, hey, Pancake, are you willing to take one step to get this treat? But as soon as he does that, especially in early training, this is a new behavior for him. Probably the next treat I'm going to toss back into the house. Um, does anyone have questions about using food lures or just visible food in this training for fearful dogs? Now, remember, it is you do have to be a little bit careful because it is possible to push a dog um, to do things they aren't really comfortable doing with visible food. But that I personally don't think that means we need to throw out food lures in this situation. I've still found it can be quite helpful. All right, so here is some use of food, visible food. Um, so here Pancake has now ventured out the front door and is on the porch. And these stairs were um, a little bit of a challenge for him, um, partly because, as you can see, he's missing a front leg and um, he wasn't very strong in the beginning, so he would sometimes fall <laughs> when he went downstairs. Uh, Holden says, how do you feel about using different values of food, like higher value to move forward, lower value to go back? I think it could be okay. Um, I've used the same value food and there's a little bit of, um, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with it. I'm trying to think like, I'm trying hard not to make, um, not to make it super difficult for the dog to resist getting the food if they're feeling a little bit scared. So actually here I'm using, sometimes I'm using his kibble or using some dried liver treats, which are pretty good, but um, I wasn't using like, you know, freshly microwaved meatballs, which might, he might be more motivated to go get. But um, if I have to use something that high value for, to get him to take a step, then, you know, chances are the situation's the setup's too hard, too hard for him. But that said, I don't, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. I do in general like the idea of having higher value reinforcers for harder behaviors. Um, in this particular case, because we're talking about it, using it as a lure or a prompt, it's just something to keep in mind is if you go super high value, um, might you be masking some, you know, moderate level of fear? Okay, so little pancake says, give me a treat. All right, so I give him a treat where he is, and then I'm going to plop one onto that first step, and he goes down, and then the next one I'm going to put right back up. So that's that little ping-ponging. After a while, he was pretty comfortable hanging out on that first step, so I think I gave him several treats there, a little more duration, and I think there are scattered treats on the step below, which is actually just the sidewalk. There's only two steps. And he decides he'll go for it, which is great. Yep, he's snacking there. So I give him some more treats down low. Um, and then he moves down off that second step. So he's not weirdly, you know, on half on a step. And then I say, okay, back up we go. You know, that was a that was a big accomplishment. Let's go inside. So that was the stairs example. Here's some more. Um, as you can see, this is a little later. He's looking braver. He's starting to move a little bit into the front yard. Um, I'm going to come put some treats near where he is, so not requiring him to go farther um, down the walk quite yet. I'm also tossing treats to the other dogs outside. I mentioned, you know, finding things that make it easier for your dog. Uh, Pancake really likes to be out with our other dogs. So I would frequently, most of the time, I would tether our other two dogs out with us when we were doing this training. So you see these were just little teeny lures, really, or prompts. Food, you know, one step in front of him. Um, treat. I really like treat scatters to encourage some exploring and sniffing. So here, this whole front yard area was like covered in trees. We actually attracted a neighborhood stray dog at some point, but um, because I was constantly tossing treats to my other two dogs and they weren't finding all of them, 
Um, and so Pancake had decided he wanted to go sniff around and look for those treats. And you can see I have that long leash and I'm just letting him move around how he wants to. Okay, so these last little clips here should have shown you the, you know, don't force it, right? I wasn't pulling on the leash. And again, that long line does help help you prevent pulling on the leash. Um, find what makes it easier. And so for, for Pancake, uh, having dog friends really helps. <laughs> and then uh, timelines, um, I'll tell you a bit more about this at the end, but this would take a while. Okay, so speaking of timelines, we have migrated after mm, probably a month or two um, from not being willing to go through the front door to approaching the street. So this is the curb in front of our house. There's no sidewalk in front of our house. Um, and this is particularly difficult for Pancake because even though this street in front of our house isn't very busy, um, we're only two houses up from a, quite a busy road that has a lot of car noise. And he is does not like car noise. He, he worries about it. So here I've got treats scattered around so he can sniff them out. You'll see that his, he did become a little more coordinated as he gained strength, but here early on, he really still, I, we couldn't take him for walks and his, his front limb um, and shoulder strength wasn't great. So you'll see him stumble somewhat, somewhat frequently. <laughs> and so you can see here, I'm not pulling him at all. And if he wants to wander back and forth, you know, though he's going to fall a bit over this curb, that's great. That's up to him. Happy little face there. This is another another day. I'm um, saying, hey, do you what do you think? You want to walk up the street? Yes, he did. But again, his pace and his decision, if he wanted to stop, I stopped. No pulling on the leash. Now here we made it all the way up this short, like a block, basically, the short street. And I love to see the dogs start to sniff and explore. Um that tells you that the, your dog is starting to collect some of the quote unquote natural reinforcers that come with walks, right? Dogs don't go for walks to get treats generally. They they like walks because they get to sniff things and explore. And um, it's so wonderful to start to see the dog, you know, doing that, getting out there, sniffing around and, and getting, you know, doing the dog things that dogs like to do on walks. Um, as soon as I could get Pancake to walk up the street, um, relatively consistently and we weren't having any trouble with the leash or anything I then incorporated one of my other dogs because um you know Pancake does like to hang out with my dogs and seems seems to be braver and be more willing to move around and explore when the other dogs are with him and so here's Juno um providing a <laughs> some scent for Pancake probably she was peeing on top of the scent Sorry for the camera work. I was trying to walk backwards with two dogs on leash. Um, having other dogs with your dog, if your dog likes other dogs, can encourage sniffing because you might have noticed that if one dog starts checking something out and sniffing, here like Pancake is probably going to go check out whatever Juno is sniffing, the other dog goes over to check it out. So that can kind of encourage more exploration. So once you're out on the walk, like I said, you want to keep that leash loose. And that probably involves moving with your dog rather than having a predetermined idea of where you're going and at what pace that you're trying to enforce with the leash. Um, I realize that this may not be how you prefer to go for walks with your dog. Um, and if it's important to you to have the dog walk steadily alongside you in a straight line at a, con a, a steady pace without sniffing, you can train that. Uh, my honestly, my preference, even with my other dogs who, you know, don't have any fear of walk issues is to kind of this is the kind of walk we tend to do. Um, they they choose as long as it's safe to do so the rate of progress and the direction. Um, in my mind, the walks are for them to to get whatever they want out of them within reason. <laughs> and so um, I let them kind of go where they want when appropriate. Um, and so to keep the leash loose, you're going to need to move with your dog and you want to anticipate when a, the leash might get tight if, and move before that happens. So you got to watch your dog carefully. Um, like I said, let them discover those natural reinforcers of being out and exploring. 
usually sniffing, let them sniff to their heart's content. I feel like this is probably quite important um, for dogs that are just learning that walks can be good things. Um, people tend to get, I know we all tend to get a little bit impatient sometimes um, when our dog seems to want to sniff one spot forever, but let them do it. This is what is reinforcing them being out. And that's what you want. You want them to be out on a walk. You want them to enjoy walks. So, you know, if they want to stop and sniff that spot for, you know, 90 seconds, go ahead and let them. All right. So to just to give you more of um, Pancake's journey and to see, I'm hoping to give you some um, encouragement if you're kind of stuck near the beginning of this training right now. So here's Pancake when he first ventured out um, off the off the road and onto the hiking trails where we normally walk our dogs. Um, there did this, these are different surfaces, which for some dogs, and including Panky, can be difficult and you need to take your time letting them get used to it. Um, there's a lot of stuff to trip over. And especially if you're a three-legged Chihuahua, um, face plants were quite frequent during this time, but you know, he wants to check out this pine cone. Great. Go for it. As long as you want. And you want to go back this way? Okay. You know, you've got plenty of slack. Here, Jasper is checking out something and Pancake's motivated to get up and check out what the good smells are. Um, introducing obstacles. If you're walking in a town, you're not going to worry about this as much. But for us, because we do a lot of hiking off trail, um, we slowly introduce Pancake to all of these different surfaces that he might have to scramble over. Um, I was pretty pleased with his bravery at this point, <laughs> although he was, he did fall a lot, but um, he seemed to be having a good time. And then this was one of his first, these are just excerpts from one of his first hikes where he was really going for it. He seemed to really be having fun. Um, he was out in front. He wasn't, you know, lagging at all or um, unsure. So here he's, you can see he's almost running up the street to get to the trail. Really booking it. <laughs> His tail is up. He's hopping along happily. And he's just doing dog stuff, right? He's out exploring. He's sniffing, he's, you know, peeing on stuff like you do. And for most of us with fearful dogs, this is one thing that we really hope for is that we can give them a fuller and happier life. And of course, enjoy more things with them. Um, so I hope you find that encouraging. He, he started as a dog who would not go out the front door. So he made pretty good progress. Now, I just wanted to talk about, as usual, I try, I've tried. i been trying to include this at the end of most of these videos, uh, things to avoid and examples of mistakes. And I can almost always find a mistake or two that I've made with Pancake. Um, so we talked about, you know, keeping the leash loose. So obviously avoid pulling the dog on the leash. Um, and we talked about this already, but avoid luring the, um, the dog toward things they're scared of using food. Um, so I have some examples where, well, here, this next slide is important. Um, how can you tell? How can I tell if I was a little too, I mean, obviously you can tell if you're pulling on the leash, right? But how do I, how can I tell if I'm using some food tosses on the ground? How can I tell if I'm pushing too hard with those and putting too much pressure on the dog, you know, to, they're trying to get a treat, but they also don't want to go where the treat is. Um, one thing is if you say you toss some treats on the ground and your dog darts forward to grab them and then darts forward to grab them and then immediately retreats back to where they were before, that's a good sign that, that um, they were really uncomfortable probably going out there to get those treats. And so the next time, try something a lot easier, <laughs> a lot closer to their safe zone. Um, if you see a dog who's got who's doing a lot of scanning, quick head movements, like they're looking for danger, um, that likely means they're a bit nervous and you need to make it a little easier for them. Or if the, you put a treat down pretty close to your dog, 
and they they stretch to get it, like stretch their neck, but they're not willing to move their feet closer. And that's another indication that um, if you're going to put food on the ground, next time you need to put it somewhere easier, probably closer to their, what I call their safe zone, which like for pancake in the beginning was inside the front door. All right, so here's some examples of me screwing up. Um, so here we are in early, oops, in early training. And I've put a treat on the doormat here and Pancake was in the house and he's come out to get the treat. He's going to grab it and he's immediately going to pop back inside. So, I mean, you might look at him and say, oh, he's wagging his tail. He seems okay. Yeah. Um, he doesn't, he's not terrified, but that was still, you know, I was still luring him with food out of his comfort zone. Um, there's enough out of his comfort zone that he wanted to get right back in as soon as he grabbed the treat. So that was a little too much. Here's another one. I put the treat C out. Um, and then he kind of backs up just a little bit, but still he did back up. Luckily, I tossed the next one in the house. Here's another. Um, this isn't actually a food lure, but another example of me being too greedy. Here, Pancake has taken a step out all on his own. Um, what I should have done here is given him a treat right where he was. But instead, I got greedy and asked for a hand touch that would... To do, he had to take another step or two out. And you'll see, I'm not actually sure what happened to make him startle back quite so much. It's possible I shocked him or something, but um, see, hand touch. Oh. Um, so that was too much. And here's another one with the step. Goes down, gets the treat, and then right away pops, um, pops back up. So that was, you know, yeah, you could say that one's, you know, ambivalent, but that's the kind of thing that if I see, I think, okay, probably I should back off a little bit. I shouldn't have used the food to lure him quite that far right now. He's not ready. All right. So here is, uh, those of you who aren't in the group, just a reminder, if you'd like to join, we have our free support Facebook group. It's um, dog kind support is the URL. Um, and we'd love to see you there. It's a nice community. All right, let me get out of here. All right. Does anyone have questions on this? Um, the first, the early steps are the slowest and can feel kind of painfully slow at times. So that first, um, I think the first training session where he was just right inside the door, um, that was probably in February. And I think the first really kind of good looking hike where he actually went out and hiked for a decent amount of time um, and seemed to enjoy it was, I think in May. So, you know, it took us several months of, we trained, you know, two, three times a week, maybe on this stuff. Um, I should also mention, um, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but if you have a dog who's afraid to leave the house and they're not already, um, we're, they're not already prescribed some anti-anxiety medication. You haven't already talked to a veterinary behaviorist about medication. I would definitely recommend it. Um, even if your dog seems fine in the house, um, you know, if we, if we had a human who was fine in their house but terrified to leave the house, we wouldn't consider that okay, right? That would that would be considered a significant welfare issue. And I would say the same is true for dogs. If they're uncomfortable leaving your house, even if they seem fine in the house, that makes you think, well, maybe they don't need daily medication. Um, being only fine in your own house is a fairly limited existence. So it's something to consider. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Pop them in. Otherwise, I'll wrap up. Um, next week, I think I'm going to talk about um, training beyond this step. So once you've got your dog going out a little bit, at least on little walks, and they seem pretty comfortable, um, what can we do, especially if you're in that situation, which most people don't have, unless you have a puppy, of going out on very first walks, what can we do right away to try to prevent future, you know, reactive behavior, lunging and barking at stuff? Um, and then how do we expand our dog's horizons beyond just, you know, our front yard and our neighborhood? How can we start getting, encouraging them to explore other areas? All right. Um, someone says, I don't, your name didn't come through, but my dog was fine.
for walks first five months after rescuing him, or he might have just been over threshold the whole time. And now he's fearful on walks. If it's just one person walking him, he wants at least two people to walk him. It's also hard to tell what triggers him. Some routes are fine one day and not good the next. Any tips? Mm. I think so. It's hard without seeing your dog. Like it would be good to see some video to get a feel for how um, how relaxed or not he looks on walks because that would affect what I would recommend. But if he's if you think he seems happy and relaxed when there are two people walking him, then I would have two people walking him for now. Um, does he get anxious even when there are two people walking him? And what does he do? Does he freeze up? Does he want to run home? Um, well, I'm waiting for that. Um, if you want help on this kind of stuff and feedback on your videos, um, I wanted to plug the membership, which is a, um, an affordable way we put together of getting some one-on-one -on -one help and small group help. Um, I will here, I'm going to put the link. I think I can do this. Let me find, I've never tried this before. Um, eh. Actually it's in, it's on, it's on top of this video. Um, it's the reactive dog Academy either on Facebook or on YouTube, it should be associated with the video, the link to uh, read about the membership. So yeah, you can post a video in the free group as well. Um, with the free group, occasionally things get away from me because <laughs> it's a big group. Um, so that's the only thing. So you might want to tag me or hopefully someone will see it. Um, but the like I said, the membership is a bit better way to get that um, ongoing support and it's so much cheaper than one-on-one -on -one training that if you're already doing one-on-one -on -one training and just want a little extra support, or if one-on-one -on -one training is totally out of the realm of possibility for you right now because of cost, um, at least, you know, you, you can still get some pretty good help. Um, you get weekly video review and feedback if you would like through the membership. Um, okay. Jenny says, if your dog freezes while you're out, any t tips for the least traumatic way to get them back home? Um, will he go for treats at all or toys? Um, what I usually do, so actually Juno, who's my girl dog, some of you may know her. She's, she's a mature lady now, but she used to do this occasionally, um, even on familiar routes where normally she was quite happy and sniffing every so often she would just freeze and bulk, you know, put her paws out. was like, Nope, not going that way. And I say, okay, well, let's go home. And she's like, not going. She just didn't want to go anywhere. Um, and so I had to find something that was a fun game to play to get her home for her. What she really loved was playing catch with treats. And so I would be like, okay, let's do this. And we, I would keep tossing treats a little bit in front of her. So she'd have to run and jump up into the air to catch them. And we do that all the way home. <laughs> um, treat bowling is another good one. If you watched, anyone watched the reactive dog webinars we did this year, where you um, take treats and like roll it down the sidewalk in front of your dogs, they have to chase it down. Um, oh, Jenny says sometimes, but not always, but you've only had kibble. Yeah. If you can um, have some other stuff with you, like chicken or string cheese or something, um, just to get out of that frozen mode, that can be good. Some dogs, if you also have a dog who's like really into, say, tennis balls or tug toys, that's another thing you can do is to try to um, just get them to play a game to get out of there. Sometimes if you can't tell what is bothering them, sometimes even just doing a little bit of that, like let's just walk down this block um, and do some treat bowling or treat catching or playing with a toy or whatever, can um, it can seem fine after that sometimes, like they snapped out of it. Um, do be a little bit careful or just be aware, be aware that um, even if right now you believe your dog is freezing to avoid going towards something scary, um, if that's always when the high value treats or toys come out after they freeze, you can end up with more freezing that has more to do with treats or toys than with fear. 
And me, if you don't mind that, that's fine. But I know I had this happen with Juno. I would never force her because she was such a fearful dog when she was young. Um, and after, but that there was some point when she was a little older where I realized, oh my God, she's freezing so that I won't pull her because she, she wants to sniff here longer. <laughs> um, or she, because she knows she's getting these treats. Um, Sue, so the free support group is facebook.com slash groups slash dog kind support. And that's, um, if you're watching on Facebook, that should be, oh, it's not above this video here. I'm going to, I'll paste it. I don't, you guys have to tell me what happens though. Cause I've never actually, um, I've never actually done this via, um, stream yard. So tell me if a, if a comment comes up for me. <laughs> Um, and then I'll here, I'll get the membership. I just posted the free Facebook group link. And then here is the membership link. So someone tell me if you can see it, because I i don't know what happens when I do this. <laughs> um, Holden says, if your dog wants to run home, like is in flight mode, should you try to run with them or try to slow them down? or slow them down with treats? Um, that's a good question. I, hmm. I guess, I'm not sure what the best answer is, honestly. I can see the wisdom in um, saying, hey, let's walk together quickly. And, but you know, I'll use treats so you can eat treats on the way home because then you're getting home and you're reinforcing a behavior you want, which is your dog walking at some reasonable pace with you. Um, whereas if you run home together, they might be on a tight leash and, you know, okay, I didn't want to reinforce pulling on leash. But um, I don't know if you chose to just run home your dog wanted to run home and it doesn't scare them. I have noticed that some dogs who want to run home, having their owner basically following them and running <laughs> seems to add to the terror. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I'm not, I don't know if one is better than the other. I guess if they're interested enough in chasing the treats, um, then it might be fine to slow them down and maybe they'll decide they don't actually want to go home. If they won't take treats, then you've got your answer. You don't really have that many other options. And if they really get into flight mode, you just got to get out of there. Yeah, you can definitely negatively reinforce flight behavior. And honestly, I don't worry about it that much because so many um, people come to dog trainers because maybe they prevented flight behavior and now their dog is aggressing instead. Um so while I don't want, I prefer the dog not feel scared in the first place, if they do feel scared and they choose flight over fight, um, that's definitely preferable. So I won't worry too much about it. It's more, you know, and if you know how to train polite leash walking, so, you know, if you're like, well, okay, possibly running away has been reinforced and possibly t pulling is being reinforced, but whatever, I know how to teach polite leash walking. And I realized that we were just in trouble and I need to avoid that situation if I can in the future. Um, I think those are, um, re it would be a reasonable choice to just run home together. Um, did you guys see the, you did see the links that I posted, like they came up wherever you are? Yeah, so this is, that is something, um, I'm glad holding you brought that up because that is something that um, I think that unless, you know, you, and I know you have, but unless people have had a lot of, um, worked with a lot of fearful or aggressive dogs, the having a dog who chooses flight maybe seems annoying to them. Um, whereas, you know, if you've worked with a lot of aggressive dogs, you're like, oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Your dog chooses to move away because a lot of dogs choose to move toward the threat, the thing they find threatening and like, you know, bark and lunge and bite and stuff. So not something we want to prevent for sure. Okay, cool. Oh, nice. All right. So like I said, next time we'll do uh, leash walking, um, expanding your dog's horizons a little bit and trying to prevent uh, reactive behavior. I know many of you are, already have it and they're trying to 
you know, fix an existing problem. But if you are in the position of just introducing your dog to walks, like you're, you have a dog like Pancake who hasn't done a lot of walking, you have this golden opportunity to head off problems before they appear. So we'll talk a little bit about that next week because it um, can save you a lot of headaches later. All right, everybody. So good to see you again. Um, I'll see you online. I'll be back um, as usual next Monday. If you have any questions about the membership, feel free to post below the video or email us. Um, our, I'll put our contact um, for our contact email is admin at dogkindtraining.com. We can give you more information on whatever you would like. I have a really nice, um, a nice client support team to help you there. All right. See you next week, everyone. Have a beautiful Monday and hopefully a pleasant but not too eventful week.